I tell you, I felt for you, Mark. There are two songs that if I live to be 150, I will never forget. One of them is, He is so precious to me. The other, I won't even elaborate on that. My wife knows about that one. That was one of those that there wasn't a right note in the song. I don't know what the problem was, but it was tough. The other one is Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. I remember at the Calvary Baptist Church in Hitchcock, Texas, meeting in a little bitty schoolhouse. Well, it wasn't a little school, a little bitty church, but their theme song was Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. And we were in school and we'd gone down to supply for their preacher who was gone for a month somewhere. And uh, we didn't know they didn't have a music director either or anyone who was willing or if they were they kept their mouth shut. And we had to lead the singing and Susan I think maybe I don't know whether she's doing the playing or not someone was playing and we had to sing that song Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. First, middle and last. What I didn't realize was, not being an expert in the ministry of music, that that song is written on two pages in the book. It started on this page and went all the way to the bottom, and then it had two lines on the top of the next page. And the music to those two lines was identical to the first two lines on the top of the previous page. And so I got up to lead that song not having looked at it, and I began to sing, and I sang down through the bottom of that page, and I went to the top. And I started verse 2. And everyone out there went to the next page, and they sang those two lines. And when I was on line 3, they started on line 1 of page 1. And we went through that song like that with me up there trying to figure out what's wrong with these people. <laughs> that they wouldn't do it right. And I finally figured it out and got with the program, but it sure was hard to sing it two more times in that service. We want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans chapter 12, and I want to share just one verse, but I'm going to use all 21 verses of this chapter. Or actually, I'm going to share two verses with you, verses 1 and 2. Paul writing to the church at Rome, having finished his discussion of those theological matters, laying down precept upon precept, those things that surely must be believed among us if indeed we are the children of God. Comes to chapter 12 and he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ordinarily, we would take those verses and we would begin to talk about how to know what is the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God for the lives of God's people. But in a matter of verses, as we read through the chapter, we discover that Paul is not leading to subjective inference those things that make for the acceptable will of God in our lives, but rather he spells them out very clearly in the verses that are to follow. And so in the closing verses, and we're going to sort of invert this chapter. We're going to begin with the material after verse 9 and go through the end, and then we're going to leave out in there verses 11 and 12 and come back to those a little later on perhaps. But in these verses, Paul sets before us what it is to be Christian in this present world. It is a picture of what we ought to be, and the word that we stress is the word ought to be. We ought to be these things in this world in which we live. We are to be seen in this world as carrying out these kinds of relationships with other people and with ourselves. And he divides it into a grouping of 12, six things that we must relate to our dealing with other people and six things that relate to our dealing with ourselves. Six things as we relate and involve ourselves in the world in which we live that should be characteristic of the lives that we live and six 
such things that as we go into the world ought to be pictures of what we are as God's people. And so he begins with that characteristic that says in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation, be sincere. None reality and falsehood and insincerity and untruthfulness, those things that are so prevalent in our day are not to be characteristics of the life of the child of God. What we do, we are to do in sincerity. What we say, we are to do in truthfulness. What we do and carry on has to have an air of reality about it and not simply some ethereal hopefulness off out yonder in the future. We are to be truthful, and we are to be honest, and we are to be sincere. Those things that, when we deal with other people, would make us to stand tall as good examples of the truth of God and the love of God in relationship to other people. To be insincere is to destroy domestic peace both at home and in the community. To live in our world in an immoral kind of way destroys the fabric of our society. And Paul says, you be truthful and you be sincere in your world and you also be discriminating in your world. It is not simply sufficient to be sincere, to be truthful, to be realistic, but you be discriminating as well. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Cast aside that which is evil and draw to yourself those things that are good. One of the things that permeates our society and our culture is the spirit of indifference. People are just indifferent. They're indifferent to whatever's going on around them, whether it's the needs of other people or whether it's the, the hurts of other people or whether it's something, whatever it is, that we're just sort of indifferent to it. Oh, well. And we read in our newspaper often how that people in dire straits find themselves dying on a city street simply because the people who are passing by don't have time or don't want to be involved. They are indifferent to the need of the person on the street. Woe be unto them that call evil good and good evil, says the Scripture. I remember reading someone many years ago was evaluating the school over which they were the headmaster. It wasn't a school for small children. It was a school for young men, men who were uh, 15 years and upwards through 25 years of age. And he looked around and he said, the, the biggest problem that I see here, the major difficulty with the students who are enrolled in this school, this problem of character among them, is that they are indifferent. They have an indifference to evil. They can take it or they can leave it. There is no abhorrence of that which is wrong. Paul says to you and to I, to you and to me, that we are to discriminate in what we involve ourselves in. We are to evaluate it. And if it is evil, we are up to abhor it. We are to run from it. We are to stay away from it. We are not to become involved in it if it is evil. But if it is good, we are to embrace it and draw it to ourselves. And we need to learn to discriminate in our friendships, in who we associate with, who we draw to ourselves as our companions in life as we go through life, our associates. When we do not discriminate between those people that we mark as our friends and our associates, we are inviting ourselves to become somewhat like they are. They we do not necessarily mold. We do not mold them. They mold us in so many instances. We have an old saying, used to use it a lot, one bad apple spoils a barrel, does it not? And if you lay down in East Texas, they say, with the dogs, you get up with the fleas. That somehow if you do not discriminate in your associations and in your friendships and if you choose badly, the influence on them will be detrimental. We need to choose the society of good men and good women. We need to select our friends carefully. And a whole range of other things we need to be discriminating. Paul says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be discriminating as you live your life. Be generous. Generosity. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, he says in verse 13. Exercising generosity towards God's people, to the brethren in Christ, and to all men everywhere in need. Be generous, not stingy. 
Be given to hospitality, says the Scripture. Show kindness to strangers simply because they are strangers and away from home and away from friends and in an unlikely environment. We are to be considered of others in their needs and their loneliness and their circumstance, and we are to be generous. We are to have sympathy. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. I used to struggle with that because it was always easy for me to be sad with somebody who was sad. I can get sad watching television and not even know the people that's going on, but it's real hard for me to rejoice when you get a raise. I don't know why. You know, somebody comes in and just overjoyed and effervescent and bubbling over, and they, man, I got a promotion and I got a raise, and I'm, I have a hard time just saying, that's great. Now, if you're honest, you do too. There's a sense of selfishness about us that seems to recoil us from rejoicing with people who are rejoicing, especially when we think we ought to have it. And if we're not careful, we're liable to say, why do they get all the breaks? But Paul says, be sympathetic. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Have a sympathetic ear. Have a sympathetic eye. Have a sympathetic hand toward those who are perishing in our world. That's what caused Adoniram Judson to go to Burma and David Brainerd to go to the Indians of America. That's what causes missionaries to reach around the world and spend their lives because they are sympathetic with the needs of people in this world. We need to be sympathetic with the poor, the sick, the suffering, with those who are careless. We need to be caring about them. We need to learn how to empathize with people. We are not out to amuse the world, but we are out to enthuse the world with the gospel. And we want to weep with those who weep and we want to rejoice with those who rejoice that we might impart to them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with effectiveness. Humility. Mind not the high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit, says the Bible. Too much pride, even in the church, will cause a downfall. Pride in one's rank, in one's station, in one's wealth, in one's learning. Exalting oneself because he has that awe about him of excellence beyond that of those near and dear to him. Someone told me that the truly great people are not aware of their own greatness. But those around them are. And the moment that you become conscious of your greatness... You cease to be great. Humility. I'm convinced that the church needs people who are able to condescend to men of low estate. We need to think ourselves more unworthy than those around us. We need to be able to stoop to wash the feet of those whom we serve. A little bit more of the humility of Christ that enabled him to wash the feet of his disciples ought to be seen in the lives of his people. Preferring one another over self. Be peaceful. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, says Paul. One way to live peaceably is not to hold a vindictive spirit that says, I'll get even with you, but rather recompense no man for evil for evil, but instead do good to them that despise you and hurt you and use you. Respond in kindness. Verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. I read this little poem, and I, I hope you appreciate it, by a fellow by the name of Kramer. To do him any wrong was to beget a kindness for him, for his heart was rich of such fine mold that if you sowed therein the seed of hate, it blossomed in charity. I think a contemporary way of relating that is to simply say, when people hand you lemons, make lemonade. 
Make something good out of evil. Don't harbor a vindictive spirit, but meet enmity and hatred and hostility with kindness. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Therefore, if any man hunger, if he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Now, Paul is not admonishing us, saying, look here, if you think about this a little bit, if that guy treats you wrong, you treat him nice and it'll hurt him. Now, he's not saying do it for that reason, but he is saying that if you'll return goodness for evil, the man who gave the evil will feel the weight of the goodness as pain. But do good. In our relationship to other people, we are to be sincere, we are to be discriminating, we are to be generous, we are to be sympathetic, we are to be humble, and we are to be peaceful in our relationship with each other, with other people. But Paul does not end there, for you see, not only do we have a social relationship and a social involvement, we have an interaction with ourselves. As we examine our own lives and we begin to look into who we are, he says there's some qualities that you need to have as a child of God. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as night is from day that thou cannot be the false to any man. Paul says, you be diligent in your business. I'm convinced with all of my soul, whether it pays high or it pays low, every man ought to have a definite work or business in life. He ought to have something to do. Something to do with his hands and his mind. Something that he can contribute to and create by. Something that he can give his life to that produces something. That's why it's important to have jobs for people. People who don't have anything to do in any work become idlers and they deteriorate in their person. Work creates character. And that creates more work and that creates stronger character. Paul, I'm convinced, would have every man have some kind of work. And if you don't have a job, you do something else. But you find something to do in life. Don't you sit in a chair and be idle. Find something to give yourself to and be diligent in that work. The Christian especially ought to be free from idleness. And whatever that work is, whether it's a lowly task or whether it's a high profession, give yourself to it with diligence, with commitment. Perform it to the top of ability. The Bible has a lot to say in Proverbs about that. It says, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. The man who works and labors. And I think still it is generally true that hard work doth provide prosperity, if not in silver and gold, at least in the metal of life. Seek thou the diligent man in his business, for he shall stand before kings, and he shall not stand before mean men. Be diligent in business, he says. Commit yourself to task. Be involved in work. Be fervent in spirit. Earnestness of spirit. That's a strong phrase. Fervent in spirit literally means burning on fire with enthusiasm. We need to be on fire. It is the enthusiasts who have done more of lasting significant in the world than any other group. They may not have all of the facts and they may not have all of the resources, but they bring such enthusiasm to their task. They are literally burning flames that conquer all else. Sometimes we call them fanatics, but by and by the day comes when they are blessed. Paul was a fanatic to Festus. Much learning has made you mad, he said. But Paul has come to be remembered and Festus largely forgotten. Earnestness and enthusiasm 
may be incomprehensible to the world, but they are indispensable to the Christian if it's not there. Something desperately is wrong. Be religious in your spirit, serving the Lord, he says. And that spirit, I think, has to be about us that consecrates everything we do to the Lord. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do it as unto the Lord. Whether you're the lowly laborer doing the small task of life or whether you sit in the seat of power and make the decisions that change the course of history, you do what you do as a service and ministry unto God. And it raises the level of that task far beyond anything that you could think or dream. It consecrates everything that you do and it brings a sweetness about life. And brethren, serving the Lord does not lead us to become drunkards. Oh, I forgot, alcoholics. It does not lead to the dishonest dealing and defraudulent activities of some. It will never place us in the murderer's cell nor on executioner's row. When we do what we do, as unto the Lord. Christian will serve God in every relationship of life, whether it's the work that he does for a living or whether it's the amusement that he involves himself in for entertainment. He will do it unto the Lord. We will say with Paul, whose I am and whom I serve. Hopefulness and joy. Rejoice in hope. Paul uses that phrase and the exact same phrase in other places. He said, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God in chapter, verse 2 of chapter 5. And I think that's what distinguishes wisdom from folly and power and from, from habit. You see, the Lord himself in his earthly life was sustained by the hope of what lays beyond who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross for the joy, the hope, what he expected out yonder beyond, he endured the hardships that were before him. Life may be difficult. Someone said to me recently, why is it that it seems that it is the good people of this life who must endure the most difficult times in life? Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this, the wicked have what they have only in this life, and there remaineth out yonder for them nothing to look forward to, nothing to rejoice in, but for you and for me who know Jesus as Lord, we have a hope that endureth steadfast forever out yonder beyond the grave, and no matter what happens in this life, it cannot be taken from us. Rejoice in hope. And all along with that, he says, be patient in tribulation. When difficulties come and hardship is there and burdens must be borne and pain must be felt, you be patient and enduring for you know that your Father that sees those things will reward them. I don't know why some people suffer and some people don't. I just don't know. All I know is the rain falls upon the just and the unjust alike. And as long as we live in this world and as long as we have breath in this physical body that sustains us, we are going to find life has its traumas and its difficulties. But he that hath endureth unto the end, the Bible says, shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord himself shall give. I look out yonder beyond the stars and I know that one day, one day, my Lord shall welcome me. He shall stand even as the loving father in the parable stood when the prodigal was returning. He shall stand as he stood for Stephen and say, welcome home, my child. And then all the suffering of this present life will seem as inconsequential compared to the glory that I shall have. And then he says finally, 
persevere in prayer. Verse 12 says, continuing instant in prayer. Prayer is the beginning and it is the end of the Christian life. We are to be permeated by a spirit of prayer, humbly seeking divine guidance for the will of God in our lives, for the power of God in our lives, for the commitment to do the Word of God in our lives. In Ephesians, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God, and he closes it out by talking about prayer, prayer, praying with all supplication and the Spirit. Twelve things. Sincerity, discrimination, generosity, sympathy, humility, and peace with regard to those about us. Diligence in business, earnestness in spirit, religiousness in life, helpfulness and hopefulness in joy, patience in trouble, and the perseverance in prayer in our person. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Brethren, if we're going to build the kind of house and know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, whose you are, that you are not your own, you've been bought for a price. If we're going to build a house, a habitation from God, we're going to have to let Him build it in us. For as surely as salvation is not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord, so also is the building of this life. And the ability to live this life in concourse with other lives, it must be by His Spirit. So we make the prayer, mold me and make me after your will. For you are the potter and I am the clay. Have thine own way, Lord. So when Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, what he's saying is, make yourself available to God to be these things. Do it tonight. Simply say, Lord, here I am, your child. Make me to be the things you want me to be in my personal person and in my concourse in life. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the grand and glorious privilege of becoming your children. And help us, our Father, to understand that that which we receive by grace through faith must be lived by grace through faith. That that which came not by power nor by might but by your spirit is sustained not by the power or might of our person but by your spirit as well. We are yours. We are yours to mold and to make. So Father in it all help us to yield our hearts and our lives to your spirit to have thine own way in our lives. Mold us and make us after thy will while we tonight are yielded and still. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Perhaps you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. God is speaking to you about trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. We want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. So we're going to stand and the instrumentalists are going to play a verse of invitation. Just one verse. And this verse is for you to decide for Christ. Maybe you're here and you need to commit your life. Maybe you just need to come and take a moment and pray and say, Lord, make me what you want me to be. This is the earnest plea of my heart tonight. As we stand together with heads bowed and no one's looking around and the instrumentalist playing very quietly an invitation hymn, you need to trust Christ, you come. You want to recommit your life to him, to be what he wants you to be. You come maybe just to pray. You can do it right there where you are. Sometimes it's important. Sometimes it's important to make that public acknowledgement of intention.
there's room at the cross for you. Millions have come and not one has gone away dissatisfied. There's still room for one more. There's room at the cross. Room for you tonight. All right, Brother D, you come and make your announcement and then dismiss us with a word of prayer.